So, everybody, yes, we've been talking about the moon an awful lot. Now we're going to talk about Mars, which is rather exciting. And um, we have got half an hour to talk about this with, with, our, with our panel here. Please do send the questions using the VivaTech app. Um, this Slido application inside the VivaTech app is really, really cool. Allows you to ask your questions with your name or anonymously. And you can also upvote other people's questions if you want to have them answered. And um, I think that we were supposed to be having a little vote on whether anybody here would actually like to go to Mars, or would they rather send a robot? Who actually would like to go to Mars? Raise your hands if you'd actually like to go seriously. Yeah, you've got a few. All of you, did you, all of you put your hands up? OK, that's good. Great, we've got our first crew then. Um, does it make sense to actually send humans to Mars? From what standpoint? From the standpoint of the risk of those people dying versus what they will find out. I think so, yes, because the ability of humans is so much more than what we can do with robots. And we will be able to answer so many questions that we have about Mars scientifically in terms of, did it ever have life? Does it still have life today? What is the geologic history of Mars? How does that tie into Earth? so much more quickly with humans than we you can You mean because humans can simply just work stuff out quicker from their situation? Exactly. We have intuition. We can move faster. You know, we can put the pieces together more quickly than a robot. Move faster? How are we going to move about faster? Um, we can walk much faster than a rover can drive. And once we've got our Mars spacesuit sorted out, yeah. which I'm sure you're working on. Um, yeah. <laughs> Morgan, tell us a little bit. Ah, oh, we're missing a microphone. Have we got another spare microphone anywhere? Having to share around microphones. I'm interested because you're a bit of a kind of a Mars gardening person. Tell us a little bit about this because everybody's seen Mars gardening on on TV at the cinema. Tell us about real Mars gardening. Is it is it possible? Yeah. So the conversation tends to be around whether we use a highly engineered system like hydroponics, aeroponics, aquaponics, um, or if we go more the field agricultural way, which is what we commonly see here on Earth. Put, put the microphone a bit nearer your, your there we Closer go. Closer to my mouth? Okay, there. great. So there's currently this conversation happening um, with technology versus using the in-situ resources of Mars, like the Martian regolith, which is the soil there, uh, to create an agricultural system. And a lot of my research is with the field agricultural side of how we can take degraded soils and revitalize them for agricultural use, which has Earth applications as well as space applications of how can we take these food insecure areas and create an agricultural system from scratch, really, um, and move it forward so that it can provide for all the needs of the crew members for the community that's there. And when I say needs, we're not only talking about food, and things you need to survive, but also the other ecological services, such as cultural needs or psychological needs, uh, having that greenery surrounding you, having a changing landscape that you can see come from barren soil to an actual full-on plant and how that helps you psychologically and physically. Uh, so there's a lot that can go into uh, an agricultural system, especially if we bring one to Mars. I'm, I expect a lot of questions about that. Please, I'm sure that you have many questions about that, about growing things in, in space. Um, Chris, t t sell us the, the robots. We talked about humans going there, but robots have done a pretty good job so far, haven't they? Uh, robots have done a pretty good job. Mars, in particular, is the only planet inhabited entirely by robots. Uh, I think our exploration of Mars is enabled by robots, but I think it will be a place where we will see robots and humans working together in developing infrastructure, in leveraging the best of each of them. And in a lot of ways, robots have and will continue to pre prepare the way uh, as, uh, as humans start making uh, their, their way to Mars. What would be your dream robot to send to Mars? Uh, a robot that, uh, the dream robot would be the one that would hand you a martini when you arrive. The, uh, the one say, that, how is your flight? A Marstini, sorry. Um, but uh, uh, 
What that actually represents is the robot that prepares for your arrival. It uh, it stores up energy. It it creates the raw materials. It it creates uh, the oxygen and the atmosphere to breathe. Uh, and probably most importantly, it creates the fuel uh, to support the supply chain that you'll need for shipping anything that you might need to or from Mars. We're going to come back and talk about some of that too, because that sounds great. Rick, um, we, you just missed the panel that was here. Have you just actually literally just arrived? Yes. Because, I mean, that was quite a run up On the stage On a motorcycle. There. Yeah, From really. the airport. That's exciting. Yeah. I, I, only, it was, I felt like Luke Skywalker. You know, yeah, over yeah, it awesome. does feel like that. I've been cycling around Paris. It's the slow version of They're the same good. thing. It's quite good, strange. Good um, we have been talking a lot about public and private roles. It, it, would it be right if a private venture only a private venture on its own, just set off and went to Mars. Oh, absolutely. Look, it, you know, it, it gets into this government versus private, robots versus people. If, if you come from the orientation that I do, and, and I'm sure Chris does, and I, I'm sure maybe our other panelists, our goal is the human settlement of space. So these are false arguments. Forgive my language, it's bullshit. What we're talking about is humans going. Now, it makes sense to send robots first, and it also makes sense for governments to invest in helping open that frontier. But at the end of the day, it's people that have to go, and that's where we're going. So, you know, you hear about going back to the moon and these kinds of things. Unless they do it right, um, we're going to end up with what we call flags and footprints, mm. which is another dead end, you know, Apollo redux. So the goal is human beings and the life of Earth. What does doing it right mean then? Sketch out doing it right. Doing it right is designing the way we go in a way that the private sector and the public sector are both moving out together. The public sector has its own needs. The government might have strategic needs. It might have science, the advancement of science, technological advancement, cultural advancement. Um, the enhancement of the morale of society. The private sector has, well, everything that motivates everybody here to do whatever it is they're doing. And you have to put the those things together. The chance to make together. a lot of cash. You Pardon? Mean? The chance to make a lot of cash. Cash, but a new life. You know, a new way of living, new ways of uh, existing together. So it all rolls in together if we do it right. But what I would add, and doing it right, is creating infrastructure. Um, this conference exists because we have the infrastructure of this conference center. Right. Uh, we have the, the water and electricity uh, and transportation coming into and from this place. And to be able to create those same things as we move out into space. Be um, it and infrastructure has traditionally been a government's job. It's yeah, been exactly. a public domain. And, and an example of doing it, well, I wouldn't say it's not right, but uh, doing it for different reasons, all out of the entire human exploration of the moon. Uh, most of the infrastructure we have is here on Earth. Um, the only infrastructure that's actually on the moon that we can still use today are retroreflector mirrors to measure how far away the moon is. That is the, the result of the infrastructure investment of all of the 1960s that, that remains on the moon. So and a bit of we, rubbish to clear up. Yeah, but we can, we can, certainly, we can certainly do better than that, uh, and we're already starting to. Tanya, um, who is definitely worth following on Twitter, by the way, Tanya of Mars. Um, she has many thousands of followers, and she needs a few hundred more. Um, what, are, uh, what are the known unknowns? What do we know that we don't know at the moment? Uh, what, are, um, what are the surprises that you suspect are lurking around the corner? Because Mars likes to surprise the people who explore it with their robots. Um, if we're talking about going there in a more sustainable way, what are the big outstanding questions? I like your point that we, there are things that we don't know. Every mission that we've sent to Mars has told us something new that we didn't know before. Like we thought we had a complete picture of Mars from Viking. We tur turned out from the next mission, Mars Global Surveyor, a lot of what we thought was completely wrong. And now we know that Mars is this very dynamic, changing place. Some of the things that are still big unknowns in terms of human habitation are how dangerous are the radiation levels on the surface? You know, we have measurements from an instrument on the Curiosity rover, but that's at one location on the surface for a limited period of time. Um, we also don't know how toxic the soil might be. 
we found out with the Phoenix Lander back in 2007 that there were really high levels of something called perchlorate in the soil, which is toxic to humans. Um, it inhibits the uptake of iodine by your thyroid. So it's just bad stuff all around. But we don't know if that's just at that one site or if that's a thing that is endemic to Mars that we're going to have Haven't to deal with. Haven't the orbiters with. revealed that it's basically everywhere? We can kind of pick it up, but we've also found out that there's some issues with our spectrometer in terms of being able to detect it. And we can't tell from orbit necessarily what the concentrations are. So if it's something that's low enough that we can maybe kind of filter it out, so to speak, we can, we can deal with it. If the levels are really, really high, that could be a problem. Although maybe Morgan can comment on perchlorate but specifically. Are, are there any particular worries, though? There's sort of you know, dark moments where you think, well, hang on a minute, we really don't know anything about that at all. I, I think the biggest issue is going to be the, the uh, complete isolation. We have people living on the space station, but they are still tethered to Earth in terms of all the mission operations are here. If they need to escape back to Earth, they can get in the capsule and come back down in a matter of hours. They can still have real-time communication with Earth. But on Mars, you lose all of that. There is no safety net. If your life support system fails, you die. You no longer have real-time communication with anybody outside of the circle that you have on Mars because of just the physics of the speed of light. That's something we'll never be able to overcome unless you get some kind of subspace communications like on Star Trek or something like that. Yeah, and that's probably not going to happen. So actually, so in fact, we're the weak link. Us. We are. The, we have technology. We have scientific knowledge. But I don't think that we truly understand how humans will behave and react in that kind of environment. And you can simulate it all you want in these different things that NASA and the, and the Mars Society have here on Earth. But I think in your head, you will still always have that safety net to know, well, yes, I'm still actually on a base on a mountain in Hawaii. If something goes wrong, they can airlift me out to a hospital. Even if you're trying to train not to think that way, that's still somewhere in your subconscious. How do we fix knowing about that problem, in fact? Is, is the Lunar Gateway or building a decent long-term base on the moon the way to fix that and actually to work out what happens? I think that helps some of it, but even the moon or Lunar Gateway are still close enough that you have that safety net. You can get back to Earth if you need to. You can have near real-time communication between the Earth and the Moon. But on Mars, you're talking about a time delay of at least four minutes and yeah. generally more like 20. And so you've completely cut off all of your real communication with anybody on Earth. Chris? In, in many ways, it could be a lot about just reframing our relationship with exploration and risk. Uh, we used to set out on ships for months at a time where much of the crew died. You didn't know that you'd come back. Uh, in a lot of ways, you didn't know where you were heading. Uh, and in the 20th first century, this is where we have it way better because of the robots. And in a lot of ways, we know a lot more about the surface of Mars than we do about parts of the ocean uh, here on Earth. Uh, so we can be very well informed what we're going, but in a lot of ways, we may not be able to completely eliminate the risk. Um, but this is something where I'm confident with 7 billion people on the planet, uh, there are enough people who are up to that challenge that we'd be ready to take it. Uh, are there enough people with the right skills who are up to that challenge? Because I'm sure you could find somebody who'd volunteer to go, but is it actually the person you want to send? Oh, I definitely, I, uh, there definitely are. Uh, uh, what, what is yet to arrive is, I would say, a, uh, a coordinated commitment uh, for a big challenge like that. We've been, we've been taking like, the next little step, but we really haven't been thinking out like, the next 15, 20 years. Like, what is it going to take for coordination across the entire planet. Well, what, what do we need to have? Do we need to actually have a, a horrible disaster on our own planet in order to motivate ourselves? Uh, I certainly don't think so. I, I think we just need to commit that, uh, as Rick had said, the point of doing all this is so that we can one day go. Uh, the, the, I've, I've built robots. I've operated robots. I love the messages they send home. Um, but the reason why we're so interested it is because they extend our presence. They extend our experience. And, and ultimately, it's because we want to go. And I, we, it's not a technology problem anymore. We, we certainly have everything that we need, not necessarily to complete this today, but we have everything that we never need to begin in earnest uh, and, and work towards it. We just need to have a, a commitment that lasts longer than a few years. It's not a technology problem. No. Absolutely not. One of the uh, challenging issues and one of the scary questions about Mars, if you're coming at it from the settlement angle, 
is what happens when you get two or three generations in uh, uh, of, of children that were born on Mars, if they can be born, because we don't know. Now, the original space station um, design that was put up in the 80s was supposed to have a centrifuge so we could test Martian and lunar gravity over multiple generations with rodents and things like that. That got jettisoned. So until you see, like, if Elon's going to go to Mars, let's say, um, until you see these guys actually testing Martian gravity over multiple generations, they're not serious. Or you might even accuse them of potentially committing murder because they're not really looking at what could go wrong. What happens with the chemicals in the soil? How do you create an ecosystem? All of these sorts of things have to be answered. We don't know what would happen if you lock people into a dome um, and they're living there for 20 years and all of a sudden the, the DuPont paint that you put in there has a chemical reaction and everybody dies because you can't open the window. See, we need people to actually be living in closed systems like now so that we can start learning how to do it out there. I think the other thing though is how, how much do we have to do before we say, we're ready, let's go. Right. Because if we just keep doing more and more experiments and more and more tests, it's just gonna be this thing that we never reach. You know, for NASA, Mars is always 20 years away. Absolutely. And you were asking about like what the motivation is. I think SpaceX is going to be the big motivator because if somebody actually just does it, it's going to feel real. And I think to a lot of people, you know, outside of us and people that come to panels like this, don't see this as something that is real. Oh, humans on Mars, that's crazy. But if SpaceX can actually do it, I don't necessarily think that their timelines are realistic, but it's giving a goal for us to strive what they, for. What if they do it and it goes terribly wrong? I mean, that could be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Not wanting to be negative, but just wondering. If, if, the, if, yeah. it, if it goes terribly wrong because of an unforeseen accident, that's one thing. If it goes terribly wrong because of negligence, that's another. So we, as, as uh, he was saying, the, the idea that people are gonna die is something we have to be aware of. And we have to be ready for that. We can't stop everything if somebody gets killed. We just have to pick up and move on. Morgan, let's uh, bring you in for this kind of gung-ho chat about, about exploring the solar system. Yeah. Um, carry on to <laughs> Titan, why not? Um, how realistic is it to imagine being able to feed ourselves with what we've grown on Mars? Yeah, so it, what I think we should do is that we could actually start developing our agricultural ecological system now uh, with the use of robots, with the use of rovers and landers, we could start building a habitation system on Mars before people actually get there. And that's the same thing with the agricultural system, especially if you're doing a field-based system, you're gonna have to prepare the soil, um, deal with the perchlorates, uh, because you don't want your plants to be, if you're using the regolith, you don't want the plants to uptake that perchlorate and have it be in your food. Uh, so actually starting now and moving forward with preparing Mars for when humans get there, starting to create your agricultural system before people get there um, in a habitation system that you build, I think that will be very, very important uh, because... But how possible is it? I mean, I can understand the goal, but mm -hmm. if it's full of horrible perchlorates or basically just dry and cold, mm -hmm. yeah. that's not great for plants. Yeah, so with the perchlorate question, uh, we actually have perchlorates here on Earth. Uh, perchlorates come from uh, rocket fuel. They're commonly found around military bases because they're used in explosives. Uh, so we have them in our soil, we have them in water systems. Uh, they're used in fireworks as well. So there's already research that's being done on how we can remove perchlorates from water, uh, from our soil. So there's already research with that and we can apply that to how we could approach uh, this remediation that we would do on Mars. Uh, so I'm not really worried about the perchlorates and as much. Would you be using the water from Mars? You would want to because just the thought of... Because there's a lot of it about if you go down enough, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we we can't take up a full spaceship with water no. with the load and the costs, especially no. the fuel that would go with that. Uh, so looking at the poles of Mars, 
looking at uh, potential permafrost that's in the soil and uh, unfreezing that, piping it to wherever you end up being and putting it through. Say, from, a, from a sort yeah. of um, managing to actually live there point of view, mm -hmm. it can be relatively warm on the equator. I think you can get up yeah. to 20 degrees, can't you, in a good day? Mm -hmm. um, sounds all right, like today. <laughs> um, but is there, a, is there a spot where, because with the moon, it's all about the South Pole, isn't it? Is there a spot on Mars where people say, actually, that is actually the spot we should go to? Well, I'm it's, sure it's everyone, probably, yeah. it, it would be the spots, you know, again, that are nearest to what the most important resources are. And right. water, because of its mass and because of how useful it is, will drive a lot of that. Um, the Phoenix mission found in, uh, water ice just uh, 10 centimeters below the soil. That was pretty far north. It was about 67 degrees north. Um, but we're finding signs of water that is seeping into craters uh, that are more equatorial. Um, in a lot of ways, though, if you think about Earth, Mars, and the Moon, Mars is nice because it has a bit more gravity. It has an atmosphere. It has resources uh, that you can work with. It has a, a day-night cycle that is a little bit uh, more normal towards human biology. It's just a little bit longer than 24 hours. Yeah, compared um, to the moon, it's literally a kinder place to be. Uh, the moon is 28 days, uh, and uh, what's unfortunate about the moon not having an atmosphere is uh, the daytime is very, very hot, and the nighttime is very, very cold and very long. So to, um, it's easy enough for a rover to, to survive overnight without solar power. It's very hard for a rover on the moon to survive 14 days. Uh, in those cold temperatures without solar power. So Mars, in a lot of ways, from an engineering challenge, is, is easier to design for. I, I love this question. It's been upvoted four times. How many decades or centuries would it take to see a Martian forest? Uh, uh, the that... Inside or outside the habitat? <laughs> I think they're Let's talking about outside. They're talking about terraforming. <laughs> Let's assume that it's That always inside. comes up, doesn't it? <laughs> so uh, when we're looking at uh, ecological systems here on Earth, it takes hundreds of years to go from bare rock to uh, a community that you see out there uh, with primary forests, secondary forests. Uh, so the question becomes, we don't have hundreds of years to wait for an ecological system to develop on Mars. How can we expedite that process? Uh, which is where a lot of my research is in. How can we expedite this ecological succession where we're going from bare rock to a full agricultural ecological system. So with a forest, you definitely have to look at the types of trees that you want to have. Uh, even for an agricultural system, look at the plants that we have here on Earth. Look at environmental systems that already have similarities to Mars because we use soil simulants here on Earth that are similar to what we would find on Mars. So. Look at the Andes, for example, in South America. There are plants that are living in that rough soil environment that has some similarities to what we would find on Mars. So, but if you go to the Atacama, I wouldn't say it's exactly full of, you know, full of life, is it? It's not. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, looking at these environments that have these similarities, see what's already growing there, and but, taking no, we, those we, plants we, and seeing how we can develop like a forest. We seem spectacularly good at destroying biodiversity. Yes. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we're really mm -hmm. particularly talented in that area. So you're saying that we, you think we can do the opposite. We can create biodiversity on another planet. Yeah, so we definitely want to keep biodiversity because if we have an unknown bio vector on Mars that we just don't know about and we have just one species, it could completely wipe out our system. And if that happens, then uh, whoever is there probably will have to go home and then we'll have to deal with the political and all, one of the, all uh, the problems involved okay, with that. It, it, well, in certain ways, there's a, it's a choice we don't have to make. Uh, on Earth, we are selecting for uh, a biodiversity that we think is favorable to us, You know, whether it's uh, land area for communities or logging or, or putting in a different crop. Uh, so we're, we're engineering it, so to speak, in that, and we're displacing something in the process. With Mars, we're not doing that. It's, it's untouched territory. I'm, I'm interested to know how tall a tree would grow in one-third gravity. I'm, I'm wondering about the planetary protection rules on this as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tanya, anything to say on that? Is it, is it kind of morally okay to just walk up and just start planting? 
It depends on how confident you want to be that Mars does not have life on it today or never had life on it in the past. If we are pretty sure that there was, there is no life on Mars today, then we should be fine. We can just go and start messing with it. But it's another question of how much testing do you need to do before you're sure and say, well, okay, there's nothing here. Or is it just, we haven't dug deep enough, we don't recognize it, we just haven't been to the right place, answering questions like that. Well, and you know, this kind of gets to the, what would the benefit on Earth question that I think we're seeing up here. Um, think about the psychological and cultural shift after the entire history of humanity has been based on destroying the ecosystem of, this, of the mother world, that if we are starting to go out to the moon and Mars and free space and carry the seeds of life, and actually we become gardeners, we become those who are expanding the ecosystem of the Earth to places that don't have life now. The very psychological shift of what it means to be a human being completely reverses from everything that's happened since we discovered fire. And we then begin to take on this concept as human beings of doing something positive. You know, and so we'll learn. You know, there are bacteria that live on the inside of nuclear plants because they can replace the damage. So we're gonna get into genetic engineering. So the pine trees on Mars may have those genes. Actually, the people on Mars you know, I call them Homo Marzialis, right? They're gonna be unique. They're gonna be designed to live in those environments. But the goal of humanity flips to that of not attacking life, but carrying life outwards. Tanya, does this all end up as sounding a little far-fetched in the kind of gritty world of planetary science? Or do people in your field actually talk about, have these kinds of conversations as well? In terms of humans actually going to Mars? Yes. I think there's a divide between people that are really enthusiastic and they think it's going to happen. They are the huge supporters of SpaceX and they want to see it happen quickly because uh, they're either young and want to work for SpaceX or they're from the older generation and they've grown up with the idea that they would be the ones that would go to Mars or their children would be the ones that go to Mars. Um, but I think people that subscribe very strongly to the NASA model don't see it as happening anytime soon because as far as NASA is concerned, they want to send, when I was in junior high, NASA's goal was to send humans to Mars in 2030. That was 15 years ago. Now their goal is to send humans to Mars orbit in the early 2030s. So these people would be going all the way to Mars to fly around it and either stay in orbit or come back. And this is following the Apollo model of yes. like, let's go there incrementally, yep. which is easier to do when something is that close. But the journey to Mars takes eight months. And the, the cost and the mental stress that you're going through to do that, I feel like we need to not approach it from the Apollo model and we need to just go. Really, yeah, okay, that's interesting. So if SpaceX phone you up and say, hey, do you fancy coming along? Well, you, would, you would be up for that, you would do it. The only reason I would say no is that I really hate flying, so I would have to take a whole lot of Advan Slightly to get off the starship. About travel sickness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the nice but if answer. they could let me sleep the whole time, I would I would go in a heartbeat. Yeah. I am really interesting panel. Um, I'm wondering whether we've convinced anybody that they do or they don't want to go to Mars now after this after this conversation. If you if you have been convinced by this and say yes, we should send humans. In fact, I would I wouldn't mind going myself then raise your hand. Has anybody, ooh, we got, we've, we've, there we go, there's a few converts. Anybody who's thought, ah, okay, I really don't fancy having perchlorates all around me, uh, I don't want to go. There we go, there's a wonderful sense of optimism there. Um, thank you everybody for coming to Viva Tech for this panel as well, it's been a lot of fun, really enjoyed it, and uh, a round of applause for our panel here. <laughs>